Okay, Christy, it's chapter eight. You've got three more to go. You can totally do this. It's just Karen. It's just her bullshit. Just keep your focus, keep your rigor. You can do this, you can get through this. All right, guys, let's go. Hey everyone, Christy here, and it's time to get through chapter eight. Um, so a little bit of an explanation about my funky top. Um, I got up this morning and reviewed my notes and then get ready to start doing the video and thought, should I change? And I went, nah, I'm too lazy. So these are my pajama tops, basically. And I really become, I've really I reached a real level of comfort with you guys because, uh, yeah, I threw my hair up and put on a bit of makeup, but I'm basically recording this in my PJs. Chapter 8. Oh my, let me tell you a little bit about Chapter 8, but first I'm going to have a little cup of tea. Hot, hot, hot. Chapter 8's been a long time coming. It was ready at the end of June, but then I forgot it, so I had to read read it again, which was painful. But we're here, and we're going to get through it today. And the chapter itself is called A God for Reformers. The subtitle I'm giving this, or actually the title I'm going to give this is, What the hell is going on? I have no idea. Karen starts off chapter 8, this alleged chapter that's a god for reformers, with mentioning the Christian West and discussing the time period of, as being the 15th and 16th centuries. So she writes, Indeed, Europe seemed obsessed by God, yet by the beginning of the 17th century, some were fantasizing about atheism. Did this mean they were ready to get rid of God? She really doesn't pick up on this idea of people wanting to get rid of God again. She touches on atheism way at the end of the chapter, um, but, and we'll get to that in time. And then after discussing this paragraph with the Christians, her next paragraph is about the Jews in Spain who are living under Muslim holdings or occupation or governance, if you, whatever you want to say. And she makes allegations about what this experience meant to the tens of thousands of people. The experience of exile entered more deeply into the Jewish religious consciousness than ever before. It led to a new form of Kabbalah and the evolution of a new conception of God. No references. This is just typical Karen just making assertions without any support. But then, after discussing the Christian West and the time frame and Jews in Spain living uh, under Muslim governance. She then spends the next seven pages discussing Islam. And I really don't think Karen understands what the role of an introductory section or introductory paragraphs are to a book. She calls this chapter a god for reformers, but does she make any effort to explain what reform is, what she means by it, and how it applies in each of the three monotheistic religions that she's discussing? No. This is just another chapter where Karen weaves a story that is grossly undersourced. She makes laughable claims as to what people thought and believe and did at the time. And she uses other people's work as an opportunity to push her own agenda in that she gives more positive space to people that she agrees with who take up a mystical point of view. And she treats very pessimistically or with contempt people who take up a more traditional view of God that goes against her mystical outlook. I've read this chapter more times than I wish I had to have read it. And I have to say, I have no idea why it's, be, why it's called A God for Reformers. I, it just seems to go over in actually the same ground as we've seen in the last two chapters. And her biases, again, are really starting to show. Or perhaps I'm just sick of hearing her repeat the same things over and over and having to point it out. As I said, you went from introducing the idea of Christianity in Europe and Jews in Europe to just switching over to discussing Islam for seven pages. And I'm going to really briefly go through this because uh, in all honesty, it's more about what people thought about God than a history of God. And as we've seen, Karen isn't doing a history of God. What she's doing is writing what a lot of people said about God and she likes what some people said more than others. So she gives them more time and space and legitimacy, even though historical scholars don't you know, haven't given these people, these people as theologians haven't had a lot of thought, they haven't had a lot of impact on the way the religion is viewed or practiced by the majority of the population. So let's go ahead and plow through seven pages of Karen's crap. 
Trying to hit the highlights, Karen writes that in the 15th century, the Sunni ulam of the madrasas in the School of Islamic Studies decreed that the gates of independent reasoning had been closed and that there was unlikely to be any innovative ideas about God in, in this conservative cl climate. And that, or sorry, yeah, in conservative climate. I, I like that this somehow um, there are meant to be innovative ideas about something that is a reality, a fixed reality. But as we'll see, Karen just makes this kind of stuff up all the time. She highlights where people who are disagreeing over a construct that makes no sense are disagreeing over it. So one person is advocating a literalist interpretation of scripture and condemning the Sufis, and another person thinks you should take a symbolic view, and we go back and forth, and it doesn't really matter. It's the same kind of debate that she's presented in the last few chapters. She then also writes some apologetics about the Islamic achievements or the perceived lack thereof during the time of the European rena rena Renaissance. I have to practice my words. Use your words, Christy. Use your words. She then wanders into the history of three different Muslim empires, the Ottoman Turks in Asia, I'm sorry, Asia Minor in Eastern Europe, um, the Safids in Iran, and the Mughals in India. She just like goes off in that direction and does another, not history of God, but a history of Islam as a political system and a religious system. And then she reports more disagreements about this nonsensical idea, quoting here from page 308. Mula Sadra believed that knowledge was not simply a matter of acquiring information, but a process of transformation. He saw dreams and visions as the highest form of truth. She then goes on to tell us what he meant by this when she writes, Mula Sadra believed that it could be realized in this life by means of knowledge. Needless to say, he did not mean cerebral, rational knowledge alone. In his ascent to God, the mystic had to travel through the alam al mitha, the realm of vision and imagination. God is not a reality that can be known objectively, but will be found within the image-making faculty of each individual Muslim. Right, that's what he said, but I don't really care what this guy says because there's nothing here that can be demonstrated and that which can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. Right on, woo, Hitchens Razor. She then wanders into a discussion of Islam coming into contact with Hinduism and what does this have to do with reforming or the god of the reformers? No clue. Again, it, it just seems like she's getting paid by the word to write these chapters. Again with the history, we see her reviewing the history of a guy named Akbar, who was the third Mughal emperor and who was religiously tolerant, and a guy who came after him who wasn't religiously tolerant, and another guy who stood out against the mystical tradition of another guy, and how Sufis had experienced a unity and felt one with an existence, but this guy disagreed with that perception as purely subjective. It would have been more interesting and useful if she would have just picked out like two or three of these arguments and showed uh, a column of who thought what about these things at different times and just track that over the course of the book. And I've tried to provide a conceptual framework about the nature of God, but frankly, it fell apart when it started just becoming a series of opinions rather than a book that we could look to and, and examine independently. And frankly, I don't know how much I trust Karen's characterization of various things in this book. But anyway, that's where we are with that. From Islam, she cites Christian anti-Semitism to segue into talking about Jewish topics and again engages in what I call in this slide unreferenced wild spe speculation also known as talking out of her ass. Look at all the assertions um, empirical assertions she makes in this paragraph without actually citing any sources. This new form of Kabbalahism probably originated in the Balkan provinces of the Ottoman Empire. The tragedy of 1492 seems to have caused a widespread yearning for the redemption of Israel. After the disaster, Jews all over the world turned eagerly to a more mystical spirituality. People longed for a more direct experience of God. Who are these people? Where are these writings? Uh, I mean, we know most of the writings we have are of well-educated men who are religiously conservative and have one perspective. That doesn't mean all people. That certainly doesn't mean all women because we don't have evidence for women. So again, Karen is making these really broad claims and I just don't believe her. Of course, as always, in order to do justice to the new vision of God, we must understand that these myths were not intended to be taken literally. Nothing is ever meant to be taken literally in Karen's world. 
she then I will just put up these quotes because frankly it's um, not worth our time for me to read them out when you have the opportunity to just look at them on the screen but what you're seeing on the screen right now is basically people who are making up stuff about stuff other people made up and since everybody is making their own stuff up we have no way of judging at all what is if anything is real and if it was real how we could even distinguish between these various competing claims so it's nonsense she then gets even though she started with christianity in the very first paragraph she finally gets to actually deep discussing the christians that she brought up in the opening paragraphs 16 pages into the chapter in her view christians in europe were not able to produce a positive spirituality apparently Duns Scotus of Oxford, not to be confused with Duns Scotus Aragena, and the French theologian John Gerson both emphasize the sovereignty of God who controlled human affairs as stringently as an absolute ruler. Thank you, thank you, Karen. I would have felt like such an idiot if I had um, confused the Duns of Oxford with the Duns of Aragena. Moving back toward her favorite topic of mystics, she talked about the centering of piety on Jesus the man and mentions Julian of Norwich who I see too as a as a hint of a proto-feminist in terms of articulating that as a woman she had valid ideas that should be listened to like uh, given respect to and she talks about the trinity living within the soul not as an external reality out there but inside like a true mystic and we know that karen's going to basically mention every single mystic in history whatever religion it comes up in just because it helps her make her points when it comes to non-mystical christianity though who does she get mad Increasingly during the 14th and 15th centuries, men and women in Europe were making other human beings the center of their spiritual life rather than God. The medieval cult of Mary and of the saints increased alongside the growing devotion to Jesus the man. Enthusiasm for relics and holy places also distracted Western Christians from the one thing necessary. People seemed to be concentrating on anything but God. Take that medieval Christianity, you suck! break. Hmm. There's only so much Karen I can do at one time. She then moves into the Renaissance as a way to segue into more of her propaganda and talked about um, a guy named Vala stressed the futility of mixing sacred dogma with tricks of dialectics and metaphysical quibbles. Petrarch, who had suggested that theology is actually poetry, poetry concerning God, effective not because it proved anything but because it penetrated the heart. And a guy whose name was, I'll just call it, Salute, Salutity? I really hate having to pronounce names on the fly. And Bruni, who both saw God as utterly transcendent and inaccessible to the human mind. She compares this with Kusa, who I've never heard of, but okay, let's go with it. He talked about a, a ways to, uh, to understand a God from a more rational perspective, which of course, Karen doesn't like at all. So quoting from page two, tw I'm sorry, 323. Thus the mathematical idea of the maximum and the minimum were apparently opposites, but in fact could logically be seen as identical. This coincident of opposites contained the idea of God. The idea of the maximum included everything. It implies notions of unity and necessity which point directly to God. If you have a preconditioned view to see everything as pointing to God, yeah, I guess it could help confirm your bias. But Karen isn't like this. She writes, yet Nicholas's clever demonstration has little religious meaning. Whoa, judgmental much? It seems to reduce the idea of God to a logical conundrum, but his conviction that God embraces everything, even contradictions, was close to the Greek Orthodox perception that all true theology must be paradoxical. What, and what does this mean? Oh, well, who knows? <laughs> Karen's just putting things together now. And, and I actually remember that you know, she could reference the chapter here and tie these ideas together if we go back where she's talking about the um, the paradoxical notions of the essence and the powers and all that, um, but she doesn't. She just goes, oh yeah, we talked about that. Then Karen is off with the fairies again. She talks about the witch craze and brings up Satan. Finally, a glaring omission if you think about how long this book has been going on and how little Satan has been mentioned given the history of the theological development of hell and satan over the course of ever and then she uses the witch trials as a way to segue into martin luther and the reformation 
Now, I'm just going to break down where Karen is talking shit. Uh, again. She writes in, uh, in one paragraph the following things. We do not know exactly why the Reformation happened. Today, scholars warn us against the old textbook accounts. And she says that it's, the changes were not due wholly to the corruption of the church, as is often supposed, nor to a decline in religious fervor. Then she writes that there seems to have been a religious enthusiasm in Europe which led people to criticize abuses. The actual ideas of the reform sprang from medieval Christian theologies. The rise of nationalism and, the um, nationalism and cities in Germany and Switzerland played a part. New piety and theological awareness of the laity during the 16th century. A heightened sense of individualism in Europe. And a, this individualism always entailed a radical revision of current religious attitudes as well as the fact that people in Europe were beginning to explore the more interior consequences of religion. Now, some of that is with assertions without evidence, as is typical per Karen, but notice that she said just in the top of the paragraph, today, you know, we do not know exactly why the Reformation happened. And then she goes on to list like seven points of why it might happen. So why would you say we don't know and then give us seven points of things that might explain it? I just, like, woman, make up your mind. Karen summarizes Luther's spiritual biography as God saves works don't, and that faith does not meet assent to the propositions of a creed, and it was not belief in orthodox opinion, but rather faith was a leap in the dark towards a reality that had to be taken on trust. Which is basically how you get people who can't think straight. You tell them to believe in X and then find excuses why X could be valid. That's not an honest approach to understanding what is what is reality. But you guys already know that. Then Karen totally negs on Luther like she was trying to pick him up like a pickup artist. I'll just read this out because I think it, her tone is pretty amusing. Luther claimed that he had been reborn when he had formulated his doctrine of justification, but in fact it does not seem as though all his anxieties had been allayed. He remained a disturbed, angry, and violent man. All the major religious traditions claim that the acid test of any spirituality is the degree to which it has been integrated with daily life. Luther, however, was a rabid anti-Semite, a misogynist, was convulsed with a loathing and horror of sexuality, and believed that all rebellious peasants should be killed. His vision of a wrathful God had filled him with personal rage, and it had been suggested that his belligerent character did great harm to the Reformation. And she doesn't like make um, uh, any out reference for this citation. That's what Karen thinks of Luther. <laughs> and I just want to point out that the, the characteristics of Luther seem to me a lot like the characteristics of the God of the Hebrew scriptures. She then goes on to engage in more speculation about historical references, Calvinism, Calvinism had been established as an international religion that, for good or ill, was able to transform society and give people the inspiration to believe they could achieve whatever they wanted. Um, you know, like, only Calvinism had ever done this? And where is your evidence that it does say this? Yet Calvinism makes its own impression. Once discarded, it can be expressed in secular ways. This has been especially true in the United States. Many Americans who no longer believe in God subscribe to the Puritan work ethic and to the Calvinist notions of election, seeing themselves as a chosen nation whose flags, flag and ideals have a semi-divine purpose. Um, fuck you, Karen. Okay, let's break down this sentence of bullshit that you just constructed. Many Americans, this is what she writes, many Americans who no longer believe in God subscribe to the Puritan work ethic. I really resent this idea that only Puritans have a work ethic. It's frankly, like, bigoted and might be slightly racist. Um, and, and the idea that um, that was where the idea of hard work came from is just insulting and wrong. She then says, the Calvinist notion of election helps people see themselves as a chosen nation. So people who no longer believe in God um, are only a good, are good workers because they were exposed to the Puritan work ethic. And they also see America as a chosen nation even though they don't believe in God because they've been influenced by Calvinism and the flag and ideas have a semi-divine purpose. I mean, where are the surveys from the 1980s and 1990s of self-identified atheists and secular and non-religiously affiliated people, Karen, and their views on patriotism? You're talking shit! 
Karen details a few other thinkers who have been lost to history because of their utter irrelevance except to soft thinkers like her. And we then go back to Calvin and have a discussion of predestination. Again, we're just wandering from topic to topic as far as I can see. Karen again shows her hand on page 333 when she writes, Once the Bible begins to be interpreted literally instead of symbolically, the idea of its God becomes impossible. To imagine a deity who is literally responsible for everything that happens on earth involves impossible contradictions. The God of the Bible ceases to be a symbol of a transcendent reality and becomes a cruel and despotic tyrant. The doctrine of predestination shows the limitations of such a personalized God. Yeah, it's a shit idea because it has no basis in reality. And that's why when you try to re read it literally, it doesn't make sense. So instead of Karen admitting that this idea is basically flawed and should be rejected, her idea is to save the concept by just making up uh, ways to rescue it from critical examination, which has pretty much been the theme of her whole, bo whole book, which is your intellect can't get you to God, you have to imagine your own God which if God was an ultimate reality, it would seem that an ultimate reality would produce a consistent result. If you ask people what two plus two is, no matter what their language is or what format you wanna put it in, they're gonna come up with the same answer. You know, So if, if you do it in images or you do it as numbers or you write it out as a problem, they're gonna to come to the same answer because mathematics is, it's a tautology, right? We've defined that four can equal a whole almost probably, you know, a range of values on the left-hand side of the equation. So if God is ultimate, ultimate reality, how can everyone make up their own version of it? She makes further unwarranted assertions about what people thought or believed. Puritans based their religious experience on Calvin and clearly found God a struggle. He did not seem to imbue them with either happiness or compassion. Well, who's she talking about here? Puritans in what period? In the 16th century? Well, how does she know? Going back to the Protestant and the Catholics about their now becoming really big enemies and wanting to fight each other over these, you know, um, angels dancing on the head of a pin. She also brings up the founder of the Jesuits, Loyola, and she likes this guy because he says things that she likes to hear. God was to be experienced as peace, hope, joy, and an elevation of mind, while disquiet, sadness, aridity, and distraction came from the evil spirit. Ignatius' own sense of God was acute. It used to make him weep with joy, and once he said that without it he would be unable to live. Like the Puritans, Jesuits experienced God as a dynamic force which, at its best, could fill them with confidence and energy. In other words, God was like the magic feather for Dumbo in the Disney film, where they have all the talents within them, but they don't have the confidence. So you lie to them and say the feather is magic and can help you fly, when really you're doing all the flying by yourself. Well, at some point, theists, you need to let go of that feather and realize all the stuff that you're attributing to God is actually within you. Because Karen is sort of anti-Christianity at this point, in terms of how it's being approached, except for the few right-thinking mystics, in her opinion, she goes over what she sees as the flaws. That, giving an example, that Ignatius prayed that after his death, his body might be exposed on a dung heap and devoured by birds, or Teresa of Avila had terrifying visions of the place reserved for her in hell, Vincent de Paul prayed that God would take away the love of his parents, Jane Francis de Chantal stepped over the prone body of her son when he uh, tried to prevent her from entering a covenant, and Karen finishes off this list of examples of how religion drove people to be dicks to say, God may have made the reformed Christians of the West efficient and powerful, but he did not make them happy. Again, an allegation that has no basis in anything other than Karen's fantasy. She writes, how can we account for this widespread fear and dismay in Europe? It was a period of extreme anxiety. A new kind of society based on science and technology was beginning to emerge that would shortly conquer the world. Yeah, I'm pretty sure she's off in that by a about a hundred years. So this chapter was about the 15th and the 16th centuries. And while the rational approach to examining the empirical world had had some kind of systematiz systematization, wow, another hard word, the fact is that the word science wasn't invented until the 19th century and technology is an even I think more modern word. So what she's saying here is that this new kind of society based on science and technology, she's really anachronistically describing what 
the social changes were at the time and making it sound as if science and technology, as you will see, gives people an ability to reject God. She writes that the god of the West had become even more frightening than the harsh deity envisioned by Tertullian or Augustine in his darker moments. Woo! And we come to Karen's sales pitch of the chapter. Could it be that a deliberately imaginative conception of God based on mythology and mysticism is more effective as a means of giving people his courage to survive tragedy and distress than a god whose myths are interpreted literally? This is really a lot more woolly head thinking. Again, look at how she uses language in this quote. A conception of God based on mythology and mysticism is more effective as a means of giving people, giving his people courage to survive tragedies. Well, is God the external thingy that's giving his people courage to survive tragedies and distress? Or is God a deliberately imaginative concept that people construct on their own? Karen wants to have it both ways. She wants to say whatever you make up about God is valid as long as it's mystical and it gives all the positive attributes of, that humans are capable to God and it, it, you focus on that and call that God and divorce that from your own humanity and just become externally reliant on this token which is called God that is the ultimate reality that we can't describe but everyone can make up. You just gotta wonder where do you cut off the bullshit? And I should have cut it off at chapter one, but we're too late now, so let's keep going. Then she starts in on describing the rise of mm, skeptical thinking by characterizing it as something bad. Indeed, by the end of the 16th century, many people in Europe felt that religion had been gravely discredited. Really? Well, who are these people? What does she mean by Europe? Is that just in Western Europe? Is that in Eastern Europe too? Who are these many people? And why can't she cite a single one? We also have the return of the infamous they. And she writes, they were disgusted by the killing of Catholics and Protestants and Protestants by Catholics. There was now too much theological choice. Many felt paralyzed and distressed by the variety of religious interpretations on, or on offer. Some may have felt that faith was becoming harder to achieve than ever. She's just making these things up. Just be aware. And then we get Karen making up the story about atheists. It was therefore significant that at this point in the history of the Western God, people started spotting atheists who seemed to be as numerous as the witches, the old enemies of God and allies of the devil. It was said that these atheists had denied the, uh, the existence of God and were acquiring converts to their sect and undermining the fabric of society. Any references for this at all? <laughs> what do you expect? Of course not. Of course she's just talking out of her ass. This is what she does. Even if an exceptional man, because it couldn't have been a woman, because they weren't educated, could have achieved the objectivity necessary to question the nature of religion and the existence of God, he would have found no support in either the philo philosophy or the science of his time, until there had formed a body of coherent reasons, each one of which was based on another cluster of scientific verifications. Nobody could deny the existence of a God whose religion shaped and dominated the moral, emotional, aesthetic, and political life of Europe. Uh, except for the quote attributed to Epicurean, which had been known and at least quoted by one Christian father in the 4th century. The Epicurean paradox is a version of the problem of evil. Do you guys want me to read it? Okay, hold on, let me go look it up. This might not have been written by Epicurus, but it is attributed to him. Is God willing to prevent evil, but not able? Then he is not omnipotent. Is he able, but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Then whence cometh evil? Is he neither able nor willing? Then why call him God? Doesn't really take scientific verification to undermine all the assertions that theists base their God claims on. You just need to ask these questions. She's making claims about the private thoughts of millions of long-dead pre-enlightenment people when we really only have the writings of a subset of men who were illiterate and highly religious. So any of her claims about people outside of the authors is bullshit. 
Karen then spends about four pages discussing the meaning of the term atheism in Western Europe before the Enlightenment. But what does this have to do with the God of the Reformers? It's really nothing connected as far as I can see. What Karen seems to be doing is setting us up for a change in the way that Europe, Western Europeans thought about God, or at least some educated Western European men thought about God, um, and with this connection of sort of science and modernity and dealing with God, the literal version of God that is so problematic for theists. In terms of the structure of this chapter, surely it would have been better for Karen to actually list out what she meant by reform for each faith and showed a development of what that reform was going to be consistent with what she'd set up in the previous two chapters. I know that's asking for a lot of logical coherence, but really reading this over, it does feel like a first draft of a PhD thesis when you haven't actually put in all your references yet. And a very first draft of a crappy thesis that still needs a lot of work. And in the toward the end, she starts to piss on the Catholics. She brings up Copernicus, Galileo, looking to see that spheres weren't perfect in the sky. And then she claims now Protestants and Catholics had both begun to put their faith in an entirely literal understanding of the scripture, as if literalism was only invented near the end of the 16th century. Not as if people have been reading these texts literally or taking them literally for centuries. And I just have to disagree with her point on this. Mysticism is a minority view. Literalism is the majority view. And Karen wants to invert all of history to promote her side, but it doesn't make her right. And to close uh, the chapter out, we get Karen's refrain about taking the text literally. To contrast her superior mysticism with these problems from the literalist, she writes about Leonard Lessius. The existence of this god can be demonstrated scientifically like any other facts of life. The design of the universe, which could not have happened by chance, points to the existence of a prime mover and sustainer. He gives the impression that the existence of God could be deduced by common sense from ordinary observation, philosophy, the study of comparative religion, and common sense. God had become just another being, like the hosts of other objects that scientists and philosophers were beginning to explore in the West. No, it wasn't that God had become just another being. It's that people assumed that gods existed or a god existed and then used a lot of different ways to try to infer that through logic rather than observing it empirically. And the problem with what is going on here is that as science becomes more deliberate and more rigorous, that all of those assertions, those inferences that were made out of common sense about the nature of God based on seeing the world fell apart. And again, instead of rejecting the concept of God as being flawed, inadequate, and ancient, and outdated, and time to throw it away, like phrenology, the emotional investment in the concept of God makes believers try to protect the concept and thereby reduce the effectiveness of the evidence against their god and they're just malleably adapting themselves to any explanation that prevents a, a critique that would demonstrate that their concepts are wrong. That's really what this book is about. Karen, of course, does not like this approach. When the arguments were disproved by the new science, the existence of God himself came under attack. Instead of seeing the idea of God as a symbol of a reality that had no existence in the usual sense of the word, and which could only be discovered by the imaginative disciplines of prayer and contemplation, it was increasingly assumed that God was simply a fact of life like any other. In a theologian such as Lessius, we can see that as Europe approached modernity, the theologians themselves were handing the future atheists the ammunition for their rejection of a god who had little religious value and who filled many people with fear rather than with hope and faith. Like the philosophers and scientists, post-Reformation Christians had effectively abandoned the imaginative god of the mystics and sought enlightenment from the god of reason. There's so much bullshit going on in this paragraph. So first bullshit was um, arguments being disproven by the new science. I mean, those arguments were problematic before the new science. It was only the confirmation bias that God existed, therefore there must be some evidence of God that is sustaining religion before, pre-scientifically. Then the idea of God as a symbol of reality that had no existence in the usual sense of the word, but could only be discovered by the imaginative dis disciplines of prayer and contemplation. That's not discovering stuff when you're using your imagination. That's making shit up.
She also asserts for the entire Western Christendom that their idea of God had little religious value and filled a lot of people with fear rather than hope and faith, as if that's not a good thing. I mean, I think there's a lot of people who would read from the Bible accurately that you're supposed to be terrified of God and that he's going to kick the shit out of you. Now, Karen doesn't like that approach to God, but it doesn't make it invalid based on the text. So again, she's weaving a story based on her emotions, not based on evidence. <sighs> We are done. We're done with the chapter. It was a heavy plow through nonsense wandering, but we did it. Yes, yes, high five. All right, um, that is about it. We've got uh, chapters nine, 10 and 11. And then I'm gonna take a break from doing book series and concentrate on deconversion research for the rest, for hopefully from about August through the rest of 2015. That's on my research channel, or sorry, my research agenda in my head that I've had for a while now. And so you can still look forward to weekly content. It just won't be about me dealing with Karen. So thank you for watching all the way to the end of the video. I very much appreciate it. If you do wanna help me out, um, I'm going to be setting up a Patreon account and starting a subscription thingy on my first year anniversary coming up in September, when I, the anniversary of my first video. But I've, let me just tell you what I do now that I'm, when I'm on YouTube, I've taken ad blocker off my YouTube channel and I sit through the ads or I get up and go make a cup of tea or go use the bathroom or go check the mail when I'm watching content for people that I really like, but I don't have enough money to support. So, you know, secular TV, I'll even do it for people I support on Patreon. I sat through for the Young Turks, I once had a nine minute ad <laughs> that ran on my laptop, and I'm just thinking, these guys need to be making a lot of money off of this ad watching. So if you can even just uh, take your ad blocker off when watching the content, it really does help. But I will be setting up a Patreon account for my first year anniversary. If you feel like putting something in a tip cup uh, I'll probably actually put a little cup in the back and it says tips in Patreon just to remind people that you can do it. Um, if you like my content, if you would have thrown me a dollar or two or five having listened through um, some of my videos on the street, you know, had I been giving it, um, preaching in the Hyde corner, or in Hyde Park in one of the corners, and then, um, yeah, you might want to uh, check me out on Patreon as well. So until next time, I've been Christy. You are always awesome. And I'll see you guys later. Bye.